Warning, warning, this podcast contains spoilers. Listen at your own risk. Welcome to Medium Shift, the podcast that investigates how stories stack up from medium to medium through the adaptation process. In today's episode, we look at a video game adaptation with a 10% rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Now, we behest Satan as he fell from heaven like lightning with Street Fighter. Welcome to Medium Shift. I'm Chris. And I'm Ev. Uh, in this episode, we are indeed doing the video game to film adaptation 1994's Street Fighter. This is, as I've kind of noted at the very beginning, one of those kind of infamous, so bad it's just good, maybe, uh, video game adaptations in a very similar vein to uh, Super Mario Bros., which if, you're not, if you have not listened to that epi- our episode on that, uh, definitely check that out because it is obviously, uh, it ex- this film exists in a, a very similar context. And potentially just as bad. So, Ev, what did you think of Street Fighter? It was not a good movie, but I loved it. I loved it so much. (laughs) I love this movie. Oh, it's so good. It's so good. Look, see, this is as as you say, this is not a good movie. It's bad in so many respects. But also, like watching it, I'm like. I can't find the willpower inside me to hate it. Mm. Like, it's just... There is so much camp, and it's just so over the top, and it's just so just hammy. I mm. think this is actually not a terrible time. Like, It's a really good comedy. Yeah, yeah. Completely unintentionally. But, like, this well, is... as I kind of, there are well, some... The director has gone and said that some of the campiness was intended, which makes sense. Yeah, there is a couple of actually, like, quite good jokes in this movie, which I was legitimately, like, laughing out loud to. But I think it just... Yeah, like, I was... I wouldn't say impressed with this movie, but I went in kind of expecting another, like, Super Mario Bros, and then it's, like, a bit of a drudgery chore to get through. But this one I would watch over Super Mario Bros any day of the week. Like, I think this movie has an actual, like, legitimate so bad it's good charm to it as i kind of alluded to at the very beginning like i think there is a lot to enjoy and appreciate in this even if it is very much not a good film and has not aged very well in any respects yeah i don't know i was i was pleasantly surprised while watching it in a way that was sort of unlike super mario bros where the enjoyment of super mario bros was very much the weirdness of it and how is this happening? Why is Reebok got a sponsorship kind of thing? Sort of the yep. whole deal with it. This was very much, okay, they clearly got the idea of the campy and colourful nature of Street Fighter. And they went all in on that. I'm like, cool. I'm yep. on board with this. As opposed to being weirded out, I'm just like, yeah, let's let's go on this fucking ride. <laughs> mm, just lean into it. Yeah. Aggressively so. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I knew almost nothing about this film before we started to do this episode of the podcast outside of um, the iconic performance of um, Raul Julia. I, I don't want to get his name wrong. No, no, that's it. That Raul Julia? Yeah, um, who uh, plays M. Bison and who is one of the most delightfully hammy just villain performances I've seen in a long time. The best quote I've seen out there to describe him is that he's, he is... He is too good an actor to be in this movie, but he's also too much of a professional to not give his not give one hundred percent. And I think that is a really great way to describe it. I feel like more than anyone, he knows what type of movie he is in in this, and he is full steam ahead, totally yep. committed, and just absolutely fantastic. Like, hands down, like the most memorable thing from it. Um, but outside of that, like this was just kind of a surprisingly fresh experience for me. And like, I didn't even know Ming Na Wen was in this movie. Yeah, no, neither. Like. Yeah, like, I'm just watching it, and, like, the, her name comes up during the opening credits. I'm like, Mina, when? What? The Queen is here. I'm already on board. And she's like, she's such a great choice for Chung Li as well. I'm like, how have I not How have I not made the connection to my brain before? So I was looking at this movie and just went, it's really weird to me that the two of the leads of this movie went on to basically help create uh, not only the first seasons, but the legacy of two of the greatest and two of our favourite 
mm. TV superhero films. Uh, not films, TV shows. Yeah. Me now and going on to make Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Yeah. One of your favourites. I'm a big Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. stan. Just as much as I'm a big stan for Arrow, mm. which starred Byron Mann in it, who was Ryu in this. Oh, yeah. He was Yao That's... Fei. Yeah, yeah. That's why he looked familiar. Yeah. Ah, cool. Good for him. Yeah, I feel like he gets a little bit shafted in this movie, honestly. That's a mm. that's another thing that we'll get into at the very least. Yeah. But um, yeah, like there is a surprising amount of like recognizable actors in this that I was not at all expecting. Um, obviously, like Jean Claude Van Damme is the big one. He was yeah. huge at the time when this movie was cast. Like most of its production budget went towards him. Yeah. I heard a rumor or something that he was like at this point in his career he was going through ten thousand dollars worth of cocaine a day, which I heard. I heard it was a few thousand a week. Okay, right. Either way, I've... an absurd amount of cocaine. An absurd amount of cocaine. I'm amazed he still has a nose. But yeah, like, I mean, outside of that, there's, as you say, Ming Na Wen, Raul Julia is really fantastic. Like, just. Uh, this movie was kind of like, hey, it's that guy, the movie, for a little while, which <laughs> I was kind of surprised for, but also, like, added to my enjoyment of it, too. So, yeah, yeah. no, I am. I, I, I legitimately actually, like, I don't know if I would. I would be very careful with who I recommend this to. In all honesty, like, I feel like a lot of people wouldn't be a huge, a huge fan. Like, you need to be in the right mindset and you need to be know what you're going into. But, like, to the right audience, I can totally see why this is a little bit of a uh, a cult hit, one might say. So Yeah, uh, it is very much a cult hit. But it's still weird that its audience percentage on Rotten Tomatoes, it actually comes second when it comes to live action adaptations of fighting video games starring people who went on to become part of Arrow. <laughs> to Mortal Kombat, I assume. Mm-hmm. Mortal Kombat Legacy was ahead of it, mm. and uh, Street Fighter: The Legend of Chun Li was right below. Oh yeah, yeah, sure. The Legend of Chun Li. What I found, we will not talk about the Legend of Chun Li in this one. Maybe in a later pod episode. But um, Neil McDonough mm. is plays M Bison in the Legend of Chun Li as like another Arrow legend. Like it's just, yeah, the connections are weird in that respect. But yeah, um, mm. and also. Again, weirdly, given it's such got a cult following, also has an audience rating on Rotten Tomatoes less than another video game, a live action fighting game adaptation starring a former neighbor star turned pop singer. Uh, are these specific categories that you can search on Rotten Tomatoes? Because this is news to me. These are specific categories that I kept making connections to and then went too far to make sure I was getting the list right. <laughs> Great, great. Which is the other one? Uh, DOA Dead or Alive, oh, which stars God. Holly Valance. Yeah, that movie does exist, doesn't it? Yes. Huh. What do you know? And somehow has a better audience rating on Rotten Tomatoes than this. That I do not understand. No. To think of any piece of media that has Holly Valance higher than Kylie Minogue is astounding to me. Mm. Should we explain who Kylie Minogue is as, like, the one Australian actor in this movie that we can, like, oh, look at us. There we are. We're in, we're, we're in this movie. Hey, hey, hey. She wasn't the only Australian actor in this film. Also, the guy who played Charlie before his mutation was Australian. Oh, yeah, before he becomes big and green with yellow hair. Yes. Yeah, sure. Who's, yep, who was supposed to be Brazilian. Um, mm. But yeah, apparently the character I believe is Brazilian in the in the film. Um, even if he's, yes, the actor is not specifically the like the. Uh, I, there's a really funny quote that I copied from IMDb um, from this film regarding like all the messed up nationalities for this film, where like Street Fighter for people aren't necessarily familiar is like obviously like a side scrolling, uh, not side scrolling, but like a a two D fighting game. Yeah, 2D fighting game, like, action versus game, essentially. And, like, obviously the conceit of the game is that all of these fighters from around the world to come fight in this one tournament, and they're all from different nationalities and so on and so forth. So the point that each character is, like, a distinct part of a specific nationality is, like, a key part of the game. And the movie tries to do that, but less successfully, I feel. And then it's just kind of... It's just an absolute mess when it comes to nationalities, like... You've got someone who's like, almost no one matches the nationality they're supposed to be playing, is essentially what I'm saying, which I do find quite funny. But I mean, not that many of the depictions of nationalities in the game are that fantastic as well, particularly coming to some of the less culturally sensitive characters, which you look at today, so. 
Well, we can get into the uh, games itself then as well. So um, this film, uh, Street Fighter, is loosely based on uh, Street Fighter 2, The World Warrior. Um, at the time, only two Street Fighter games had actually been released, like the original Street Fighter and Street Fighter 2. Uh, Street Fighter 2 is like one of the juggernauts of like video game history in so many respects. It had like three different versions. It was so popular, like leading up to this movie, like... To be specific, it had five different versions. Mm. This movie was based on the third iteration of the sec- of Street Fighter 2, known as Super Street Fighter 2, The New Challengers. Yeah, which added four additional characters. Yes. Yep. As well as the previous one, which like made four of the characters, the four bosses, playable in the game as well. Yep. So, yeah, so there's the original Street Fighter 2, then there was Championship Edition, which added the four bosses, then there was... Turbo Hyper Fighting, which increased play speed and added a few new special moves. Then Super Street Fighter 2, the new challenges, which this movie is based on. And then Turbo on top of that as well, which included introduced super combos and then Akuma, um, a new hidden character. So, uh, and that is not even include, and that's only talking about the versions of Street Fighter 2 that came out previous to this film. There have been quite a few more since then. Yeah. But yeah, it is kind of it is kind of hard to overstate the success of Street Fighter 2 as a video game like this was kind of the arcade hit kind of in tandem with mortal kombat but like street fighter 2 started this trend through the like the the um the 90s essentially like there's a reason that this movie was fast tracked into production just after a few years after this game was released so and fast tracked to a deadline <laughs> yeah yeah we exactly were too yeah and Capcom being, uh, as typical for video game companies, like, deeply meddling when it comes to trying to create the film, too, so... Which, uh, does fit a very specific trend that we've talked about before, so... This movie was very specifically in in the zeitgeist, in a way, because it was just... It, it's an adaptation of what was one of the most popular and successful video games ever at that point. In fact, it, the video game is the reason that two of the actors actually signed on to be in the movie... Mm, yeah. And the fact that both Raul Julia's children liked it and he wanted it to be in something they could watch and enjoy. And Damien Chapa for the very same reason. His son, I think, was super into the game. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. So, And Street Fighter has continued on since then. Like, it's still very much a long-running franchise, franchise in a lot of ways. Obviously, we're only going to be talking about the first couple of games because all of that stuff came after this film at the very least but it is like i guess like street fighter and mortal kombat are like the two if you think like a 2d fighting game like these are the these are the franchises that you think of that being said we probably will get into some of the others when we get around to doing the rest of these 2d fighting game adapted from movies Hmm. yeah absolutely in which there is a surprisingly long list yeah weirdly enough like this is it it feels like I, I don't know if this is something just because of the way that, because of the popularity of the genre, or just kind of the narrative elements of it, which there isn't really a lot of, but like fighting games have very frequently lent themselves towards film adaptations and also more cinematic like um, depictions as well. Like I think it's just, there, it, there's a bit of a weird trend that Street Fighter kind of started, but then was continued by the Mortal Kombat films, and then, like, uh, what's the name, the Dead or Alive movies as well, and then all the various incarnations as well, and even just the simple fact that, like, you know, the Injustice games are kind of a continuation while they are a combination of, like, a cinematic franchise with the fighting game genre, so, yeah, there's always been a perpetual overlap with that genre and, like, more filmic depictions, which I think is kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. I think it has to do a lot with the fact that it's very, sort of, martial arts based and very stunt work heavy Mm. which is something that film can do really well uh when it comes to trying to adapt things they try and focus on their strengths Mm. even though a lot of these movies turn out to be quite terrible (laughs) (laughs) it's true uh it it's they basically go along and it also helps that they know they can get a built-in audience both with the game and with just fans of action films given how similar a lot of these moves are to things like the matrix uh film series and all these other big sort of sci-fi-esque action films with a lot of slow motion fight scenes and various martial arts without being super specific Sure, sure. Like, it fits into a very specific, like, Hollywood lineage, essentially. Yeah. And it is one of those things, like, uh, we'll get into it, but, like, Street Fighter 2 doesn't necessarily have a strong narrative component, but a lot of the fighting games 
uh, since then, like contemporary fighting games, has a very, very specific like narrative through line. Like I know NetherRealm Studios um, very often tend to push that these days with the Injustice games. I believe the Mortal, latest Mortal Kombat game as well, which I have not played, um, had a very intensive story mode and actually had some story DLC come out a little while ago too. So um, I think I think that reliance on narrative, especially more recently, definitely helps that too. Even if you didn't have that with the original Street Fighter. Yeah, even Street Fighter now has gone on for the very narrative based group they've taken everything from basically street fighter 2 and went okay through other video games and comics and various lore and web series in some cases uh we're going to try and flesh out the rest of these characters and turn it into a narrative and work out Mm. how they all interact with one another yeah yeah exactly which i mean just just makes advertising so much easier in that respect so um it's a shame that all that came after this movie (laughs) i mean it's a shame in some respects, but also, like, this movie wouldn't be the same if it was actually drawing from this specifically narrative and cinematic Street Fighter V. Like, I feel like we wouldn't get John claude Van Damme making bad... Well, actually, we wouldn't get John claude Van Damme making jokes post-2000s anyway, but, um... <laughs> yeah, this movie is just, like... On one hand, like, the the trajectory of fighting game genres, it certainly would be interesting to see what, like, a big-budget contemporary Street Fighter film would be like... But this movie is such just a product of its time that I just can't see it existing in any other context, in the way that it is anyway, so... You don't really need to project. They've made a very close, critically acclaimed, essentially, movie based on Street Fighter that is held very close to the narrative, and it's called Street Fighter Assassin's Fist. Street Fighter Assassin's I've never heard of this before. It was uh, basically uh, started off as a fan film that gained a lot of traction and Capcom just said yeah we'll give you the uh, rights for the license for Street Fighter Mm. and then with a great uh, Kickstarter they managed to create a web series that all sort of fit in to make a movie Wow! uh, that got launched by Machinima and got a bunch of distributing rights. Oh that's really cool I've never heard about that before yeah and it's actually like quite good well I assume that there had to be a lot of fan support for it so yeah, and yeah, it's considered the best of the live-action Street Fighter movies to come out. Mm, yeah, awesome. Probably because it had actual fans and people invest in the source material, I guess. Yeah. Yes, and it stayed, and because it was made in the 2000s, it had a plot that was very akin to the actual games. Imagine having a plot. <laughs> Just wild. <laughs> Yeah, cool. Ah, oh, okay, interesting. I might actually have to... Do... We, we, maybe we should do that at some point. That'd be an interesting one to continue on with. So, once again, all of that comes after this movie. <laughs> um, Regarding... So, obviously, this is, like, an uh, adaptation of Street Fighter 2 specifically, even if it, like, kind of draws elements or has to from the original Street Fighter. Do you have any, like, specific, like, um history with Street Fighter 2 in any ways? or Not a huge amount. Like, I never played i was never super into fighting games especially those 2d i could not work it out the best i could do was the injustice series that we've talked about and that's purely just because i was a dc fan i'm like okay if i'm gonna get this story i need to play this game and so i had to learn the hard way how to do that yeah fair but i've always known about street fighter because it is such in video game history such a big franchise and a big historical moment moment all those fighting games both it and mortal kombat were huge mm. I mean, if it wasn't for Mortal Kombat, we wouldn't have the age rate, uh, age rating system for video games. Mm, yeah, absolutely. So, so those kinds of games were always quite big. You hear them talk about it all the time, and they've become massive. They were like, they were also like probably some of the earliest esport, I guess, attempts. Them, the racing games, and later on RTS games like StarCraft mm. were sort of the ones that took over. I mean, Street Fighter Two even had a tournament mode made in the arcade cabinets in which four arcade cabinets were all connected together and based on who won certain matches people would have to actively move around to different cabinets to play in a tournament yeah it absolutely has the prototype of like early esports stuff especially street fighter 2 and its popularity Mm. so Mm. so yeah it's always been something i've sort of noted and been around and yeah it's part of pop culture osmosis if you're a video game fan so you're, i was always gonna be sort of aware of everything mm. that's going on here sure sure no i i have a weird experience with this game as well on that when i was growing up i went backwards in video game generations like growing up my next door neighbor had a playstation and then a playstation 2 um so i was playing like gta san andreas as like six years old which is 
very weird in hindsight. Mm -hmm. Um, But then when we moved um, and our parents refused to get a console, um, so I I essentially had nothing to play until uh, our neighbors across the street were selling their old Super Nintendo with all their games. Um, And so I went back in time from like the PlayStation 2 to the Super Nintendo with games like Bubsy and Mario Kart um, and Street Fighter 2. Like I have played a ton of Street Fighter 2 back in the day when I was really young on the Super Nintendo that I got secondhand. Um, and it was great. Like, it is a you know, it's a really fantastic game, obviously. I was terrible at it. I still had absolutely no idea how to play, and I don't think I ever actually bet any of the campaigns um, or any of the characters, but, um, yeah, no, I, I really enjoyed it. And so, like, having that, that kind of iconography is, like, so embedded, as you kind of say, like, especially the image of, like, Ryu and Ken and then performing your first Hadouken and stuff like that. Like, it's just... I don't know. I'm lucky that I had at least that experience, um, as weird as it was in hindsight. So I think it's worth getting into uh, some of the adaptation elements, I guess, when it comes to the game and the film. Yeah. So the game itself, like the closest thing it kind of has to a narrative structure is that it is structured around kind of an international tournament where you choose a character to play and you progress through the tournament by fighting all these different people in different countries in their home grounds. Um, until you eventually unlock the four Shadowloo bosses, I believe they're called, which is essentially like the evil crime syndicate that you need to beat. And then once you've beaten the tournament, each character kind of gets their own individual, like, oh, this is what I'm doing after the tournament. Like, you know, Chun-Li's like, I, my father, you have been avenged, and now I can go back to being a hot single girl again. That is, I, I wish that was joke, but that's literally her line or something. It shows her in a, yeah, it's, it's bad. So that is like the kind of loose narrative frame of Street Fighter 2. Obviously, they they adapt that quite significantly to the film itself and that the setting is Shadowloo, which is this like fictional East uh, East Asian country. And then they kind of shoehorn or justify uh, the reason for almost every single Street Fighter character to be in this one specific place <laughs> and just fighting each other in perpetuity. Almost every single... Every single character in Street Fighter, the new challenges in this game, except for Fei Long, which was the uh, essentially their version of Bruce Lee in the game. Every other person appears in one form or another, basically. And even Fei Long was sort of loosely adapted in their new character that was meant to sort of take on the reins in Captain Sawada. Mm, yeah. Yep. That did even not if, pan out. No, even if that didn't necessarily go anywhere, so... Yeah, no, I mean, like, I think it's probably worth getting into, like, some of the characters specifically, because there has been, even if the characterization and the narrative is, like, quite loose in the games, there has been some specific changes. The one thing that I did find kind of odd is that mm, this film turns Guile into the main character, essentially, because they get uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme to play him, obviously being the biggest actor and also being the American character as well, whereas in the games... Uh, mostly because Street Fighter 1 and 2, uh, Ryu and Ken are supposed to be... Well, essentially, the in the original game, the only two people you can play as is Ryu and Ken, who are basically just body doubles of each other. Yeah, but in this, they turn it around into Guile being this ex-military... Uh, or what what's the name? Navy guy or something, trying to avenge his fallen buddy Charlie, which is from the game. In the game, he's trying to beat M. Bison, who murdered Charlie in, in the past. But in the film, they turn Charlie into another character while also keeping the revenge arc and at the same time so yes so just to clarify what was said there the belgian played jean claude Va- the belgian jean claude van damme played the uh-huh. american colonel guile who in the original video games was part of uh, the air force and was an air force captain and lost his friend charlie who was a marine mm. in the movie uh, Guile became one of the leaders of the Allied Nations, who are not the UN, but close enough, mm-hmm. while still being American despite being played by Belgian. <laughs> and Charlie became one of the commanders of the Allied Nations, who then got captured and turned into a different character entirely in Baraka. Yep, Baraka. They essentially combined Charlie and Baraka into the same thing in this game. Yeah. Um, Because Brocker in the original is basically just this mutant, I guess they kind of describe him as this Brazilian guy with green skin and has an electricity attack who joins the tournament to discover the secrets of his past, which he does. At the end, if you you win as Baraka, he meets his mother. It's eels, isn't it? Sorry? (laughs) It's eels. Eels? What? Oh, (laughs) 
<laughs> yes, very good. Very good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That's the cutscene at the end of his story arc. He was like, he falls into an eel pit or something, and he's like, oh no, not again. <laughs> uh, yeah, but in this, like, they well, that was him... what first mutated him. It was, was e- it? electric eels. Oh, okay. I missed that detail in the original game. Yeah, it was a uh, like an experiment, I think. Or some, really? Uh, no, oh, some. I don't know. Very loose. Something to do with electric eels turned him into electrifying green man. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Yes. Yep. Once again, very loose. So. Yeah. Yeah, let me see. Yes. So, outside of that, so, like, Guile's arc remains relatively the same, that he wants to avenge his buddy Charlie. Um, Chun-Li's arc is still quite the same as well, in that uh, M. Bison murdered her father. She's going out for revenge, which is, like, told in this really, really iconic iconic scene in yes. the film. Especially with that line, which is the one line that I heard from this movie before I saw it, which is, like, when Bison graced your village, it was the most important day of your life. But to me... It was Tuesday, which I just just love on yeah. so many levels. It's just, ah, oh, it's so hammy. It's great. Um, yeah, so that is kept consistent at the very least. Although in the games, Chun-Li is uh, not a journalist, but an Interpol agent. Yep, yep. But although that's sort of kind of hinted at in the movie in the sense that, yeah, she's a journalist, but also she's apparently a ninja. Yeah, like she's she's undercover as a journalist at the yes. very least. That's what it seems to kind of suggest. And working in tandem with um a couple of the other characters, Balrog, who was one of the uh, original Shadowloo bosses um as well, which is a little bit odd that they kind of make him a bit of a good guy. Um, and then one of the other characters as well, who um like the like the game is a sumo wrestler, Honda. Honda, that's the one. Yeah, e Honda. E Honda. Outside of that, uh, Dalism is kind of his character is completely different in that. In the game, he's a very caricaturish uh, version of an Indian man with super stretchy arms who can breathe fire, um, who just wants to go back to his family. In this, he's a scientist who just wants to go back to his family, so... I want to clarify the stretchy arms and the fire breathing is because he is a master in the spiritual and practical art of yoga. Yep, yep. He's a super yoga man. Yeah. Yep, I would have been so much more interested in yoga when I was younger if I knew that it would let me breathe fire. Um, just saying, I feel like they should be advertising that more. Yeah, so outside of that, like, the rest of the characters kind of are almost entirely, like, constructed just for the services of the film. Like, Zangief is a bit of a brute who is from Russia, but is not as proudly Russian as he is in the game, perhaps. At no point does he dance with the Prime Minister uh, of Russia. Yeah, which I was very upset about. I was really hoping that would be an end credit scene or something like that. Yeah, and he doesn't crush anyone's skulls between his imposing thighs or anything. I was, uh, was quite disappointing. He does have one really funny line, though, at one point. You're getting paid? Oh, quick, change the channel. That's oh, right. yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when the truck is barreling at them. Um, I thought that was quite good, so. But yeah, then outside of that, like, I really don't think many of the other characters are specifically drawn on from the game and like part of the fact is that the characterization in the game is like fairly loose like there's almost always just like a um the the visual design is potentially more important than you have the name the nationality and like a brief biographical description and then that's essentially it as well as the ending as well so that being said costume wise they did a very good job Mm, they're mostly spot on yeah yeah the costumes from the new challenges but yeah yes oh well they sort of mixed and matched when it came to some of them Mm. Like, uh, Chun-Li's outfit came from the Turbo version rather than the New Challenges, as did Guile's outfit with the yep. blue instead of green. Mm-hmm. And they sort of just avoided everything with Kami. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of understandable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah, and it's the same thing with, like, um, the one of the characters that obviously I feel like gets fleshed out the most in this film compared to the game is M. Bison. And then mm. in the game, he's got essentially nothing going outside of being a real big imposing guy the story behind his name is actually quite interesting i was looking up as well yeah so in the japanese version of this game um of the original street fighter street fighter 2 which is obviously Mm -hmm. you know where it was created all of the names for the shadowloo bosses were completely swapped around and balrog who was modeled after mike tyson was called m bison as in Mm -hmm. mike bison uh but when they're going to the u.s they were afraid that it was too close and they could potentially be sued so they swapped all of the names around 
So uh, M. Bison in the Japanese game is actually called Vega, and then Balrog it was originally M. Bison, and then Vega was Balrog. And then Sagat <laughs> was still the same. He, his name yeah. never changed, but um, yeah. So uh, that is why his name is M. Bison, because he was originally supposed to be based on, based on Mike Tyson, and then just his name got swapped around. But I think it kind of works. And um, in the Japanese dub of this movie, they didn't, like, change it back round. So mm. it's still M. Bison because everything was plastered, obviously, with M. Bison on all of his stuff and Bison Topia and. Yeah, the exactly. Paxis Bisonia or whatever it was. <laughs> it would have made things a little bit more difficult um, than just like subtitling it, basically. Yeah, but no, in this, he is fleshed out into like this, this evil warlord slash crime boss, which is all kind of alluded to in the game, rather. Mm. But it is like obviously more fleshed out and turned into a very grand scaling antagonist with this big plan of world domination just because he was also like taking advantage of monorail technology which is not a cut i was expecting (laughs) to let him magnet like to let him levitate and shoot lightning because of course like when that happened i'm like this is terrible but also i love it and i don't know what else i was expecting so well they needed something grounded and realistic they couldn't just go with the whole psycho boost power that he mm. has in the games that's just absurd oh yeah absolutely that'd be way too nonsensical and complex for the film we need it grounded in realism we need superconductor <laughs> electromagnetism <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah of course i love that just like pseudo scientific explanation that he just throws out in the middle of that monologue like it's just it's so dumb but i enjoyed it so much <laughs> he makes it work he he makes it all work i just like uh, it's uh, for people who are not familiar as well. This film is dedicated to Raul Julia because he um he was struggling with um cancer uh, at the time of filming and such. This was his last role. And as tragic as it is for like this is this film um to be like the one that he goes out on at the very least, like it is kind of a, an incredible homage to his professionalism and his ability to sell basically any line he wants to um just by sheer charisma and magnetism. So. Is there anything else you want to specifically touch on regarding adaptation? Like, the the game is, uh, with, with much like Super Mario Bros. in a lot of ways, the game is very loosely uh, an inspiration for the film. Like, the film takes a lot of liberties yeah. and adds so many more different elements to the characters. Some elements which the franchise picked up on as it went along, others which are completely disregarded, so... I will admit, probably more... In this film than in Super Mario Brothers, they really picked up on the iconography of the games. Mm. Like, even though they basically relegate the whole thing to the fictional Shadowloo country, yep. they managed to incorporate a lot of aspects of the globe-trotting art and designs of the backgrounds into it. Yep, as well as the international cast as well, so it's yes. a big part of the film. I'm impressed on the diversity as a whole. Even if they did some weird things where they completely changed around, they managed to somehow cram in more diversity than I was expecting. Especially with <laughs> taking E Honda, another Japanese character in the game, mm. and turning him into an American Samoan. Mm. Yeah, which is a bit of a surprise. So, but it worked because the actor was charismatic and funny enough for it to like be interesting for a bit part like that. Yeah, like I think it's kind of surprising, especially for a, a, a '90s action film starring John Claude Van Damme, directed and written by the guy who wrote uh, Die Hard. Yeah, yeah, which is the one big thing to his name. I was having a look at his filmography. I'm like, geez, man, you peaked, <laughs> you peaked <laughs> once, and then that was it. Um, so, but yeah, no, I think in that respect, it's kind of nice. And like, even even like a little bit of the touches, like how they recreated some of their special moves as well during the certain fighting sequences. There are illusions in the choreography. That end, that freeze frame at the end. They're all doing all their victory poses. Like it's oh, I just, love that so much. Yeah, there is they, no point to it. It is pure fan service, and it is the best. Oh, it's a hundred percent. Like it's such a dumb ending, but I enjoyed it immensely. Uh, um, so I think you make a really good point that I think I think this movie is uh, even if it is not even if it is still a loose adaptation of the game, like it is still very much connected to and appreciative appreciative of the game um in the way that super mario bros is definitely not so for fans of street fighter like i feel like you've probably already seen this but i like you probably get a kick out of bits and pieces of it even if it's not fantastic like there's still enough like kind of nonsensical hammy charm for you to appreciate in hindsight so yeah i was 
I don't want to say pleasantly surprised with this movie, but I in I enjoyed watching it more than I expected, and I think it's not it's not an absolute dumpster fire of an adaptation in some ways. It's not good. It's certainly not a good movie, but it's like it could have been it could have been Super Mario Brothers. Ah <laughs> uh, yes. So, did you want to quickly touch on the fact that this was apparently an absolute goddamn nightmare to create and how that affected its adaptation oh yeah the production behind this as well yeah yeah a lot of issues yeah like it's it's become a little bit of a recurring trend especially while we've been researching these um video game adaptations that the original company tends to have a little bit too much creative control that kind of ruins the franchise like we've seen that with ruins the film we've seen that with assassin's creed there was a little bit of that in detective pikachu super mario brothers was ironically the most hands-off, but also the worst film. <laughs> um, but this one, like Capcom, was like very stringent that it needed to hit a specific date, and there was a they lot kept of very... changing things as things got added. Yep. On top of that, there was also Hasbro, mm-hmm. who had a toy manufacturing deal and also wanted to hit things before Black Friday, so they made changes to the actual props. <laughs> yep. Yep. Of the movie, which, which is to just benefit weird. the toys. Mm. Um, there's also the fact that like uh, the budget for this was not big, and yet they wanted John Claude Van Damme, which was a hu- who was a huge actor at the time. Like mm. so much of his budget, m- much of their budget went towards him, and it turns out he was an absolute nightmare to work with on set because yeah. he was in the middle of a cocaine addiction, and that he would show up late or he wouldn't show up at all, or he'd be really uncooperative, and they would have to film around it and constantly change their schedule. There were problems with like shooting schedules and orders where like they would build sets and then tear them down and then actually have to rebuild them again and things like that. There was a lot of, uh, it, it was, it does certainly doesn't sound like it was an easy production at the very no. least. So they planned it to have all the choreography done in like practiced in the first half of shooting where they do all the dialogue heavy scenes and then have the fight scenes actually play out in the second half of the schedule. But mm-hmm. that had to be completely flipped around because unbeknownst to them, uh, Raul Julia had just come out of surgery. Mm. And it was looking a little too frail for up-close scenes, according to the director. So they had to basically improvise all the fights on the spot. Yep. Which is just kind of crazy, so... Which, according to Urban Legend, led to Byron Mann almost getting impaled by a real knife. Jesus, yeah. Look, I, I won't deny that you can kind of see some of the seams and the issues on screen in some way. Like, we haven't really touched on Jean-Claude Van Damme in this, but I don't think he's very good. Like, I think he's no. just kind of going through... In in a weird way, a hammy 90s Jean-Claude Van Damme action movie has Jean-Claude Van Damme as the worst, or, like, the least interesting person in the film. But I feel... I don't know. Like, maybe it was because of that I was familiar with, like, some of the production behind it at the very least, but you can kind of see the seams in the film in some ways. And in some ways, I think it certainly detracts. Um, but in other ways, I think it just adds to the kind of, like, hammy like bad so bad it's good movie um aesthetic i think in some ways Mm. so shall we move into do it differently then or have you got any other final thoughts no i think that's covered jingle 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 jingle. jingle. i can go first okay uh so my thought in a very weird twist i came up with a do it differently for this and then realized afterwards that it had kind of already happened (laughs) in that This uh, this movie actually spawned a Saturday morning cartoon in the style of G.I. Joe that went for a couple of years after this, which I thought was kind of funny. It wasn't ex- my exact pitch. What I would kind of want to do for um, Street Fighter is that... All right, answer me this, Ev. Okay. What is the best thing about anime? Um, okay, this is a family-friendly show, so I can't say what I really <laughs> wanted to say. So I'll yep. just say over-the-top artistic style. Okay, well, that's good too, but I was going to say tournament arcs. Ah. And you know what Street Fighter is? 100% tournament arcs. <laughs> so basically what I want for this is essentially some form of long-running anime that is very over-the-top and like wildly like colourful and aesthetically pleasing, very similar to the game as well, Um, that is just centred around this Street Fighter tournament that can be run by the Shadowloo group and then Bison is the boss, blah, 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 blah. And with all of these individual characters kind of coming in, not only does it make it easy to justify why all of these characters are here, just tournament arcs are fun in anime sometimes, I guess. So I would kind of want to see that that feels just like an appropriate setting, I guess, for Street Fighter. It being a longer series as well as compared to a film means that 
a lot of these characters actually can get a little bit more to do and a little bit more characterization. Um, anime just naturally leans towards a really bombastic, over-the-top action fighting sequences, which I think works great for the franchise as well. Um, honestly, it just seemed like a really easy fit for me, so, yeah. And it means we can get a proper Hadouken in there. Yeah, yeah, exactly, rather than just doing, like, the hand motion that one time, so... <laughs> Yeah, so disappointing that he wasn't spitting fireballs. Anyway, what about you? Okay, so my original thought was, you know, I could sort of do this where it's like sort of a more modern take and I completely sort of try and fix everything wrong with it and basically just make a whole movie. But I'm only doing that if I'm getting paid, Capcom. I need that sweet, sweet dough. Who else is going to pitch you such great ideas as Joe McHale as Guile? Oh, Jesus. Yeah. I say that because he's already done a very good job in Street Fighter Red Tape, a web okay. series that you should definitely check out if you're a Street Fighter fan, because that is a good parody. Hmm, cool. Yes. So instead, I'm taking myself back in time, seeing how I would have tried to fix things using the weird executive medallion that Capcom did. I'm sort of ignoring all the other massive problems that the production had, like sets blowing up, all the cast being underweight and not eating the exorbitant amount of money spent on cocaine and Thai massage parlors, Uh big uh quotation marks. Yep. But I'm still going to basically take the movie and just try and fix it up with little bits that hopefully turns it into a bit of a better story. So starting off, first off, you, ha- you just swap the names of Balrog and DJ. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. I can see that. And then change his boxing gloves into kickboxing attire. And literally you have a more accurate... Gloves on his feet. Are those the thing? I haven't watched enough no. kickboxing. Okay. But yes, you can swap them around. Immediately you've already got more fidelity in your story in having Balrog actually be a bad guy and DJ being a good guy. Like in the actual games, without really having to do any other changes to their yep. characters. Brilliant. Also, you can call Captain Sawaya Fei Long. Mm-hmm. Really get that crammed in. In hindsight, we know Captain Sawaya does not become a mainstay. And Sawada himself, he can just be pissed. All right? Mm. Yep. I'm okay to deal with that. I'm keeping uh, Byron Man as real. Because that was another part of the story, apparently... Capcom really wanted Sawada to play Ryu. Yay, executive meddling. So yes, uh, and basically how I would do this, keep the start relatively the same, have an actual fight between Vega and Ryu in the beginning in the cage, don't immediately break it with Jean-Claude Van Damme. I mean, I don't want to wait that long for a fight. The way he breaks it, though. Like, driving oh, yeah. a tank through a wall. Like You keep it, know. you just push it a little later so we actually get to see a street fight in the Street Fighter movie. <laughs> Sure, sure, yep. Plus, that will lead in later to changes that I make down the road. Because really, what do you want when you want a Street Fighter film? You want to see the Street Fighter characters fighting each other. Yep. So that is my main aim. Yes. Preferably in a street, yep. (laughs) Well, look, anything will do. Hell, a Japanese bathhouse is used in one of the backgrounds. That's That's fine. good point. (laughs) Yep, yep. So basically, keep all that. Keep everything with Chun-Li. Dramatically reduce down Van Damme's role. Mm. I re- one, because I don't want him being the lead. Two, it means he works less on the set, which is the betterment to everyone else in the cast. Yep, yep. And three, you can still end up putting him on the poster and get the star power out, but actually start building up future stars, like who should have been the lead this entire time, which is Chun Li, played by Ning Nao. Yes! The Queen lives! Yes, yeah, the Geek Goddess. Mean, Woohoo! She has to be out there in like the pantheon of geek culture, doesn't she? I feel, I feel like, uh, like still niche. Like Agents of Shield became like a. I'm thinking more a... the fact that you know she's the voice of Mulan. And... Well, yeah, sure, <laughs> but I mean, like it, Mulan is, I wouldn't necessarily call like a nerdy or geeky thing. Like Disney is kind of its own beast, but yeah, sure, I know what you mean. Like yes. within a specific audience, like she's definitely beloved. So like I cheered a little bit when she was in the new Mulan movie. She's in one scene. She has one line. Yeah. That's it. It's the okay. best line in the movie. So. <laughs> Yes. I might even say the only good one in the movie, but that's another thing. <laughs> we'll get to that episode later. I'm sure we will, <laughs> yeah. So yes, uh, basically have the story revolve around focusing mainly on Chun-Li, and then to the side, Ryu and Ken, and to their little gay romance subplot. Romance! Yep, oh, okay. 
Yeah, no, I, I'm more than bored with making those guys openly homosexual. I yeah. think it really fits. Hell, like, even in the 90s, that would have been weird, but even the way they do it in this movie, there's enough, like, subtext, and mm. you can make a very good reading to the fact that these are life partners in some way. Yeah, it alludes to a queer yes. reading, I feel, so, yeah. And honestly, it's one of the... It's probably the only good romance subplot you could get out of this movie. <laughs> I don't know. I really, I, I want to see what what how M Bison would function in a romantic relationship. Like, match him up with someone. I don't know who. Maybe Zangief. But just imagine that dynamic. I just want to see Roll Julia and like just a, a really really hammy romantic subplot. That sounds amazing. Yeah, but the character himself would be more in a romance plot with like a mirror. So that's true. That's true. Yeah. Yes, much like Vega. Mm. So yes, have that. Uh, you could have the sort of initial boat scene with Van Damme and Cammy and T Hawk in there, but instead of them blowing up and faking death for a second time, mm. actually just have them <laughs> captured and have Chun Li be the one presumed dead while she goes around being a ninja kicking everyone's ass. Also, mm. being better you, than Guile. Yes. Also, you would get rid of that weird little moments where the lead character of Guile almost is a little too quick and too happy to mercy kill his best friend. He really leans into that fast, doesn't he? Yeah. He's like, well, guess I'll do what I gotta have to do. Just, it's like, Jesus, man. It's like, no, he's no. still a person. <laughs> yep, just, oh, my God. Yeah, that, it, uh. look, another reading of this movie, Guile is a psychopath. Um... Hmm. Who was maybe actually on cocaine for most of this film. <laughs> in game. In game. In the film and out of the film. So. Yes. You know what? I'd be okay with that as a subplot. That's my new subplot. Yeah. Mm. Guile has a cocaine Very addiction. Yes. Life imitates art. <laughs> art imitates life. <laughs> yes. Uh, and so, yeah. And it basically, you can have Bison's first fight being against Guile, but his second fight is against Chun-Li. Uh, as it should be, she's probably getting vengeance and as the one most in need of revenge against Bison. Mm. Because sure. Guile does get his friend back in a way Ryu and Ken don't really have a grudge. <laughs> They're just mm. there to help people. Yep. So yeah, they... And so while they have that big collect scene, you can still have the fight as well. The other good long fight in Ryu. But he takes on Sayid and Ken takes on Vega. Because that mm. makes more fucking sense. Yeah, in just a sense. bit. <laughs> and also gets rid of that whole weird moment where Ken's just like, nope, fuck these people, bye. <laughs> for for <laughs> all of five minutes and then immediately goes back. I was like, yep, okay, I'm back now. <laughs> yep, yep. I didn't find anything good to steal, so here I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that yeah. was a very weird moment. So yeah, that's basically, those are the main changes. Focus yeah. more on Chun Li. Cool, good stuff. I totally agree. I feel like she should have been the main character. And she is the main character in the next Street Fighter movie. Even if I have not seen it at this point, but apparently it is quite awful. So, yes. Yeah, uh, well, even despite worst Mimic of Dung, all, she's, Chun-Li is not played by ming Na Wen. So. Yes, that is true. That Who, is true. That's I still feel even at this age and this time could probably still pull off oh, Chun-Li. Yeah, <laughs> God, hell yeah. Like, I mean, she's she's essentially playing some form of Chun-Li through, like, couple of seasons of agents of shield so yeah she's great she's so good super cheerful in real life but then she's so dour in the show it's very <laughs> funny yeah no anyway moving on from me no. <laughs> good stuff um well shall we move into random recommendations then okay what have you got to recommend us at this episode of i am going with another action kung fu comedy movie also with a cast that you with a lot of hey i know those people more than you'd Classic. expect for this type of low-budget B movie, uh, and that is Balls of Fury. Oh, I think I've heard of this film, but I don't. This is the kung fu film without any kung fu in it. Oh, All okay. the kung fu is replaced by table tennis. <laughs> that sounds amazing. It, it is. It's surprisingly good. It, again, it's not fantastic, but it's great. The cast is really good. You have Christopher Walken playing the bad guy. Oh, that's good. That's good. Uh, with his second in command being played by Aisha Tyler. Mm-hmm. And it is just absolutely fantastic. I don't want to, like, spoil it too much, but there are some great lines in there that are complete parodies of what you'd expect in a movie. Like, one of the lines early on when they're training up the young American protege 
is the fact that it's like, ah, you have completed half your training, though, as he's, like, easily knocking back all the walls. And it's like, what? And is it because I don't have honor? I don't have spirit? I don't have the blessings of the king? No, you have no backhand. Just knocks it to his other hand and completely misses. <laughs> <laughs> it's very good. What, wait, what year did this film come out? Oh, it was in the mid-2000s, I want to say. Okay, sure. So not around the same time as Street Fighter, but yeah, cool. That honestly sounds great. I'll have to check that out at some point. Yes. Oh, it also has Diedrich Bader in it. Ah, uh, yes. The Silver Age Batman himself. Yes. Or at least to me, the voice of Silver Age Batman. Ah, oh, except Adam West. But yeah, anyway. Yeah. That's great. Cool. No, awesome. Um, I was going to recommend um a ironically uh, another Kung Fury or Kung Fu movie from the early two thousands. Is it Kung Fury? <laughs> no, no, it's not Kung Fury. I thought about Kung Fury. Um, but it's a film I saw for the first time a little while ago called Kung Fu Hustle. Ah, which is yes. Essentially, a cross between a Jackie Chan movie and Looney Tunes. <laughs> Probably the best way I would describe it. Like, imagine the most kind of ridiculous, over-the-top kung fu you can you can imagine, and it's just even more absurd. Like, kind of jumping up into space and punching someone into the ground, kind of thing, or like literally running like Roadrunner at some point. Like, it's just. It's 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 very silly, but it's very yes. very well made. It's extremely funny. The action is quite exceptional. Um, yeah, I I really enjoyed it, and I feel like it fits a. It's it's kind of like Street Fighter in a way, in that it's just kind of so hammy. It's absurd and entertaining, but the difference being this is actually a good movie. So, <laughs> <laughs> and actually, I think legitimately well made and. Uh, absolutely worth seeing so yeah kung fu hustle i definitely recommend it it's by the same guy who made um shaolin soccer which i know oh, people yeah. are a big fan of as well which i have not seen yet myself but i plan to after i've seen now that i've seen kung fu hustle so yeah absolutely recommend it very nice i i have sure. seen parts of kung fu hustle and i have to admit it is very good <laughs> it's very good absolutely wild but just so great big big time uh. enjoyment Cool. All right. Well, thank you to everyone who listened to this episode of Medium Shift. We can be found at mediumshift at gmail.com. Feel free to send in your tragic one-line backstories to our email. We might read them. We might not. Who can say? Next episode, we are going to be continuing with a um uh, another adaptation in the Street Fighter franchise, but not the one you may expect. <laughs> we're doing Street Fighter the movie. No, no, no. We didn't just do this. We're talking about the video game called Street Fighter the Movie. Yeah, we're doing the video game that was based on this film that was originally based on the game, so look forward to that. <laughs> it's going to be... It might be a short episode, might not. I don't know. If anything, we get to laugh at pixelated Van Damme, so... Uh, until then, fare thee well. Hadouken! <laughs>